Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, MAP060, Selling Sustainability. We have some brief housekeeping before we start. This is an AIA accredited presentation, which means if you haven't done so and you're interested, please send your information to us at mapedigital at mapay.com and we'll be happy to take care of that for you. Your phones are on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box in the corner of your screen and we'll answer them at the end of today's session, time permitting, or via email after. And you can always send questions to that email address, mapedigital at mapay.com. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Brittany Storm. Brittany is the Sustainability Manager for MAPE Corporation. Her background as a sustainability building consultant and in construction allows her to speak to audiences about both the big picture and technical aspects of a project. She's a lead accredited professional, AP, with BD plus C, and ID plus C specialties, as well as being a Well AP and FitWell ambassador. In addition, she's active on many sustainability committees. With that, I welcome her to the microphone. Brittany, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar today. As Jen mentioned, this is an AIA presentation. Uh, if you would like some CEU credit, uh, send your information to mapaydigital at mapay.com. Today you'll learn about a few things related to sustainability. One, the, the history of sustainability and sustainability today. We'll discuss some of the uh, sustainability programs that are available and their impacts on the environment and occupants. We'll get a better understanding of the demand for transparency. We'll learn about uh, some product declarations and, and get a better understanding of how to select products and uh, selecting products and, and getting a better understanding of their impacts on the environment as well as uh, human health and safety and understand uh, questions to ask, you know, what types of documentations are required for sustainable programs, uh, including learning how to e easily navigate some uh, acronyms and terminology that are used in construction or sustainability construction and design. Just a brief history on green building standards. Green building standards and certification systems establish environmental and health performance criteria for buildings. They each have varying approaches. Uh, some of these standards are certifications you may be familiar with. Uh, sustainable design and construction gained popularity with the launch of the Building Research Establishment Environmental Assessment Method, or BREAM, in the 90s. It was the world's first environmental assessment certification, and the certification became uh, more popular in Europe um, however, they are making their name known here as well. In, in early 2000s, USGBC or the US Green Building Council introduced a similar program aimed at improving energy efficiency and environmental practices of buildings through LEAD or Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. That's a green building rating system that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Other green building standards and certification systems uh, responded to the growth of, of the, the growing interest or the demand for sustainable design and construction, including programs like Green Globes. A Living Building Challenge came around came about in, in 2006. Uh, Living Building Challenge is considered lead on steroids to most people. It, it's one of the more difficult certifications to achieve. Uh, and then some, some building codes or, or local governments have started their own uh, standards or certifications like uh, the Cal Green or California Green Building Standards Code. Uh, Florida has their own Florida Green Building Coalition or FGBC. Uh, there's also the uh, International Green Construction Code or IGCC. And they have a 
a comprehensive set of requirements uh, to reduce negative impacts of uh, buildings on, on the natural environment. More recently, additional green building standards and certification systems have been developed to address other sustainability related issues such as human health and well being. Uh, in 2014, the well building standard was the first standard to focus solely on how a building impacts human health and wellness. Uh, so, for example, designing a space so that a staircase is closer to the main entrance than an elevator would be. Uh, choosing products with low VOCs um, and, and et cetera. There's, there's many different requirements within like a well building standard that are related to health. Uh, other, other certification systems such as the Center for Active Design, uh, they have a fit well standard which follows in well's footsteps. Uh, there are other standards that have uh, expanded to have supplementary programs or labels uh, including the, the Living Product Challenge. This is a, a certification for products primarily for use on Living Building Challenge projects. LEED has supplementary programs like ParkSmart for parking garages or SITES, which is not shown here, uh, that's specific to parks or outdoor areas. In, in 2020, some of these green building standards had supplementary certification programs such as the Well Health Safety Rating, or the FitWell Viral uh, Response Module. And programs like LEAD uh, have pilot credits to, to pr better prepare workspaces for building re-entry. Uh, there are a lot. Uh, there, the, these that are shown here are, are, doesn't even put a dent in the um, amount of green building programs that are out there. But uh, it's, you can see that it's continuing to grow So this is pretty much what you just saw on the last page, but there are, there are green building uh, rating programs that are in use around the world. Uh, they each vary in their approach as we just saw on the last slide. Uh, some have uh, outlining prerequisites with optional credits, while uh, some have a pre prescriptive approach and others have performance-based requirements um, that are met in different ways for different products and uh, different project types. The three most popular rating systems are LEED, uh, WELL, and Living Building Challenge. So all of those in the center column. And we'll talk about those three in more detail today. So LEED, or Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, is the most well-known green building uh, rating system. It was developed by USGBC, or the United States Green Building Council. It's administered by GBCI, and they administer the LEED certification for building projects, as well as LEED accreditation for sustainability professionals. Uh, LEED is currently on um, version four. There is a beta version 4.1 out as well. Uh, version four, it was difficult for manufacturers, designers, contractors, and, and sustainability consultants uh, but it's getting easier as more and more manufacturers are joining the transparency movement. Uh, there are currently three active versions of LEED. Uh, LEED version one through three focused on using building products or materials with recycled content, low VOC content, and sourcing locally. And version four and version 4.1 focus on using building products or materials with uh, environmental product declarations, health product declarations, and more stringent VOC emissions requirements that we'll talk about today. LEED breaks down as follows. Uh, there's a project rating system uh, based on the project type, and then there's credit categories, and these categories are made up of prerequisites, which are mandatory, and credits that are points. And today we'll focus on products that contribute to two lead uh, categories, which are materials and resources and indoor environmental quality. Uh, projects are required to, to earn a minimum of 40 points for basic certification. And then the more points that are achieved, the higher the certification level. So as I mentioned before, LEED has three active versions, uh, version three, version four, and beta version 4.1. Uh, version three is set to sunset um, in summer of 2021, so upcoming. Um, so you may 
have seen uh, projects that are, are trying to wrap up um, all of the documentation that's required um, to, to close out their version three projects. Living Building Challenge or LBC. Um, LBC is again, lead on steroids. Uh, so for example, lead allows the use of just about any material in the con in the construction of a building, uh, you know, with the exception of it has to have low VOC materials. You're selecting products that hopefully have recycled content. They're sourced locally. They have transparency documentation. Uh, but Living Building Challenge goes a little bit further. They're they're more stringent in their requirements. Uh, for example, they have a requirement that buildings not use materials from a red list of materials, and, and we'll talk about that more later. Uh, this this certification program was developed and inter administered by ILFI or International Living Future Institute. There are several certifications, including uh, Living Building Challenge, Pedal Certification, which means you're achieving three of the seven pedals that you see there on the right, and there's a couple other imperatives. Um, Living Product Challenge, which is selecting manufacturers that participate in the in the living product challenge program so you're you're limited in the um, amount of products or the selection of products uh, available right now within living product challenge uh, lbc developed the red list of materials that we talked about a little bit and we will talk about further um, and these are not to be used in construction they also created the declare label uh, to disclose hazardous materials you may have seen or uh, had to requ request a declare label. A living building challenge is made up of seven petals, energy, equity, health, beauty, materials, site, and water. And there are a few active versions of, of living building challenge as well. I think version four just came out not too long ago. And today we're going to focus on products that contribute to two of the petals, which are materials and health. And this diagram shows uh, all of the International Living Future Institute certifications from uh, their zero carbon certification all the way up to the full certification of the Living Building Challenge. And you can see the, the different requirements that you have to meet in order to get each of these certifications. And lastly, the living building standard. It's again, the first of its kind. It's the first rating system to focus on the occupants of a space. It was developed by Delos and administered by IWBI or the International Well Building Institute. I like to explain well um, as it, it, it's synergistic with with lead or living building challenge uh, where lead leaves off or where living building challenge leaves off well picks up uh, so how does well fit in well using plumbing fixtures as a, as a for instance uh, lead looks at a kitchen sink or a lavatory faucets gallons per minute where a well will look at that same fixture and ask how the water quality will impact human consumption. And there are other parameters to meet as well, um, but you could just see where they, they lead and well tie together, but they also are looking at two different things. And uh, as of uh, 2020, there's over 4,000 projects with over 52 million square feet in, in almost 60 countries. So it's, it's certainly gained popularity. Uh, you can pursue uh, well and lead or well and living building challenge simultaneously. And there are currently uh, two active versions of well, version one and version two. And I do not believe there are any current sunset dates for well version one. Uh, well version two now includes additional uh, credit categories. In the past, they had less credit categories under version one. And now under version two, there are uh, 10 uh, credit categories. And again, they focus, well focuses on the various impacts on the body system. So each credit or feature as, as well calls it, uh, within well uh, have various impacts on the human body. So well breaks down as follows. There, there's credit categories or concepts um, 
that these categories are made up of preconditions that are mandatory and optimizations or uh, credits or, or points is to, to gain um, different certification thresholds. So we're gonna focus on um, products that contribute to these concepts today. So air, uh, materials, and mind. And obviously, I guess some, similar to LEED, uh, the more points achieved, the higher the, the certification level. So up until now, we just discussed uh, green building certifications, and now we'll talk about green product certifications. There is a big difference. Um, you know, products cannot achieve LEED certification or a well certification or a living building certification. You need green product certifications to achieve green building certifications. And it, and it cannot just be uh, one manufacturer, you know, providing a label and, and saying that we're, you're certified. It, it takes a whole project team uh, to make a green building certification happen. And these are just a few of the green product certifications or attributes that a single product can have. There are an estimated 600 green product certifications around the world. So when, when talking to sustainability minded customers or people, um, they, they use the word transparency a lot. They, they wanna know what, what is in a manufacturer's products and how it will impact the environment and or building occupants. Uh, transparency started with the formation of the Living Building Challenge, uh, the Well Building Standard, and then previous versions of green building certification systems like LEED uh, or Green Globes have implemented health-related credits uh, more stringently than they may have had in the past. So similar to uh, a nutrition label, uh, you know, we, we demand to know what's in our food. Why not demand to know what's in our building products? So now we're gonna talk about a product's uh, environmental impact. So the construction industry has a significant impact on the environment. Uh, according to some studies, construction is responsible for up to 50% of climate change, 40% uh, of energy usage globally, and 50% and of landfill waste, uh, not to mention air, water, and noise pollution, uh, as well as the destruction of, of natural habitats. So the depletion of raw materials means that you're using uh, non-renewable resources, which will eventually run out. Um, and there, there can be many impacts a product can have on the environment. Uh, participating manufacturers will perform life cycle assessments that we'll talk about to identify a product's impacts on the environment or our footprints, uh, as well as areas where we can make improvements or uh, you know, having, um, handprints, showing our handprints and what the efforts that we're making to, to make our environment better. So as I just mentioned, a LCA or a life cycle assessment, uh, this assessment is uh, an assessment of environmental impacts related to a product in a life cycle perspective. Uh, products are evaluated not only on the basis of its uh, end of use, but also all of its life stages are taken into account or taken into consideration, uh, starting from the extraction of raw materials um, with which the product is formulated, transportation and subsequent transport to the production plant, uh, processing phases uh, that include the product in the factory and its packaging, transportation to the customer, uh, actual application or installation, uh, use and maintenance, and then until reaching the, the end of life where the product either goes to a landfill or is recycled. An approach in which all phases of the product's life are taken into consideration is called from cradle to grave. Uh, if the evaluation ends after the production phase, it's called cradle to gate. So using the specific uh, calculation software, there's um, a software that takes into account the data relating to the product life stages. Uh, it's possible then to, to quantify the impacts that a product has on the environment. Uh, these impacts include uh, global warming potential or how much heat uh, greenhouse gas traps in the atmosphere, 
uh, photochemical ozone creation potential, eutrophication potential, acidification, uh, ozone depletion uh, potential, like the, the chemical compounds uh, amount of degradation in, to the ozone layer, and, and also um, abiotic uh, depletion potential. So the depletion of non-living resources such as fossil fuels. And then all of the aforementioned life cycle assessment, um, the, the the calculations that come from you know, identifying uh, different impacts on the environment, all of that analysis is summed up into a report known as an environmental product declaration or an EPD. EPDs quantify a product or a material's impact on the environment from extraction of raw materials through the disposal of a product or a material. So having an, an EPD does not imply that the declared product is environmentally superior to its alternatives. It's purely voluntary for a manufacturer to uh, pursue EPDs. It just states the environmental impacts there, there's as it is. Um, so there are a few types of EPDs. There's product specific EPD. Uh, this is a for products that have publicly available LCAs. So uh, a manufacturer has gone through the life cycle assessment uh, up until cradle to gate scope. Um, it's usually specific to one manufacturer and um, it has to conform with, with various uh, ISO standards, but it, it's, not, um, it's not a final environmental product declaration necessarily. They, they, they've started the analysis, they've gotten about halfway through it, and um, they can share that publicly. There's also the industry-wide or generic EPDs. So products with third-party certification uh, with a, a manufacturer is explicitly recognized as a, a participant in the program. So for example, uh, the, the center uh, graphic, um, that has TCNA uh, cement mortar for tile installation. This is a general EPD for mortars, uh, and they also have one for uh, grouts for participating manufacturers. And you can see on the list there that it, this industry-wide uh, EPD lists all participating manufacturers. And there's also uh, product-specific uh, EPDs, which the manufacturer is named as the sole manufacturer on uh, the environmental product declaration. So this typically means that uh, the manufacturer is doing their analysis in-house or has a third-party uh, reviewer, third-party certifier, verifier to confirm that um, you know, the life cycle assessment of their particular specific products um, are have an EPD. And then there are these these three types of EPDs have varying values if you're pursuing lead, um, starting with product specific declaration. I think they're worth like um, a quarter of a of a product under version four. Uh, industry wide's worth a half a product, I believe, and then uh, product specific type three EPDs are worth one, and I think that changes under four point one. Recycle content, I'm sure most are familiar with this. This has been around since uh, green building standards have been around. Uh, recycle content is you know, using products with recycle content that have um, resulted in, in lower in environmental impacts when compared to using raw materials. Uh, so pre-consumer uh, is when you divert um, during the manufacturing process and post-consumer would be diverting after the consumer use. So pre-consumer would be putting materials back into production and then post-consumer would be after consumer use putting back into production. Some products have third-party certification for re recycled content. It's not required. Uh, recycled content certifications demonstrate that manufacturer's commitment to conserving natural resources. Uh, it also qualifies for for products um, to achieve LEED and other green building standards or certification systems. Not all, again, as I just mentioned, not all um, manufacturers have to go through third-party testing 
for uh, recycled content. It's just you know, sometimes when you have uh, astronomically high percentages of post-consumer or pre-consumer, um, you, know, you want to get that third party verified to show you know our, what we're claiming is actually true and uh, backed up by a third party. In the next section, we'll talk about uh, health impacts. So how products um, or green attributes or certifications um, contribute to, to health. Studies have shown that poor indoor impacts, uh, poor indoor air quality impacts the health and overall well-building of building occupants. Other research indicates that Americans spend 90% or over 21 hours of their days indoors, uh, where concentration of some pollutants can be 10 times higher than what it is outdoors. I don't know about you, but with all of 2020, I feel like I spent more than 24 hours <laughs> indoors. Um, it's important to create spaces that are comfortable and healthy environments. Uh, several studies have pointed out that uh, working environments with, with excellent internal environmental quality, but also like lighting, ventilation, and other fundamental parameters um, in living comfort, they lead to greater productivity um, in, in workers or employees. So why does indoor air make us sick? Uh, there are common contaminants that are the main cause of poor indoor air quality. Uh, exposure to VOCs can result in a, a range of health issues from asthma attacks to headaches to elevated blood pressure, uh, but there's other contaminants such as you know, airborne particles, um, household odors, microorganisms, et cetera, that all contribute to poor indoor air quality. And uh, it's it, just a side note here, it's it's not about uh, green building certifications. It, it's not just about them uh, demanding VOC compliance. I would say um, you, you see more than 90% of consumers uh, consider indoor air quality to be extremely important or very important. Uh, it's a leading category within green building, uh, more so than performance or renewable energy and building science. Um, homeowners have become quite savvy about green products and they're demanding proof to show that indoor air quality products can back up manufacturer claims. Uh, so it's important for manufacturers and builders to provide certifications and other documentation that demonstrate clear results. Comfort is the leading purchase driver behind indoor air quality considerations across all consumer audience segments. Uh, followed by uh, security, sustainability, quality, and wellness. So uh, do-it-yourselfers are, are most active with respect to indoor air quality content, and this provides opportunity to target uh, do-it-yourselfers with sustainability or um, indoor air quality products, just as you would um, pursuing a green building certification. The next section we're going to get into is volatile organic compounds or VOCs. Volatile organic compounds are organic chemical compounds whose composition makes it possible for them to evaporate under normal indoor atmosphere conditions of temperature and pressure. Organic chemical compounds are everywhere in both indoor and outdoor environments because they have become essential ingredients in many products and materials. Uh, so outdoors, uh, VOCs are, are volatized or released into the air, mostly during manufacturing processes or the use of everyday products or materials. Uh, indoors, VOCs are mostly released into the air from the use of products and materials that contain VOCs. VOCs are, are of a concern uh, to both indoor and outdoor uh, atmospheres. That they do impact uh, air pollutants. There are VOC regulations for outdoors, uh, mainly because of their ability to create photochemical smog under certain conditions. And uh, the main concern indoors is the potential for VOCs to adversely impact the health of people that are exposed. So the higher the volatility, the more likely that the compound will be emitted from a product or a surface into the air. 
In order to be considered low in VOCs and compliant with various green building rating systems, products must meet two requirements that we'll talk about now. The first one is that we limit VOC content. So content is as simple as it sounds. The content of VOCs in a product or how much of the product is VOCs. Uh, the content of VOCs in a product vary. It's, it's important to evaluate, select, and install building materials that minimize exposure to VOCs. Uh, there are regulations in place to limit VOCs in products. Uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District, or SWAMID, is the most stringent VOC regulations in the U.S. Tile setting materials or, or floor setting materials contribute to, to green building standards and certification systems by selecting adhesives and sealants um, that meet an established indoor air quality standard. Uh, so South Coast Air Quality Management District or SQAMID has rulings for uh, floor setting materials. So either uh, rule 1113, which dictates VOC content for paints and coatings, including floor coatings, and rule 1168 for tile adhesives and sealants. I think I might have said one. 168 twice. So rule 1113 for uh, paints, coatings, including floor coatings, and 1168 for adhesives and sealants. LEED defines products that are inherently non-emitting sources of VOCs like stone, ceramic, uh, powder coated metals, plated or anodized metals, uh, glass, concrete, brick, clay brick, um, or unfinished or untreated solid wood flooring. They're all considered fully compliant without VOC testing. Um, if they don't have you know, a, a surface coating or a binder or a sealant, uh, ceramic tiles and, and porcelain tiles would uh, be zero VOCs and meet the requirements of, of being uh, inherently non-emitting as, as an example within our industry. So the, the one of the I just mentioned with the VOCs, um, they're expressed in uh, grams of VOC per liter uh, of a regulated product, less water and less exempt compounds. So a product's VOC content is found on um, a manufacturer's TDS or SDS, sometimes there's an EDS, an environmental data sheet, or a PDS product data sheet, um, but you would look through a, a manufacturer's uh, product information to find uh, VOC content because you do have to pull this documentation for uh, a, a green building certification program. Uh, the second step would be to identify VOC emissions and these are different than VOC content. Uh, VOC emissions is the VOC content that evaporates into the air, so the quality of the air. Uh, emissions are present in higher levels indoors. Uh, these are the emissions of that installers or end users are breathing in. Uh, manufacturers can voluntarily choose to have products tested for emissions. And there are standards such as the California Department of Health or CDPH. They're currently on version 1.2-2017. And this provides a foundation for manufacturer claims for low emitting uh, building products. So during this uh, simulation or, or VOC emissions testing, the air which potentially contains the emissions of a product uh, would be sampled. It's tested to determine uh, the concentration of a specific volatile compounds of, that are of concern and then um, you know, sent into uh, a third party certifier to review and uh, certify. So as I mentioned, uh, just using flooring and floor setting materials as, a, as examples here, you know, tile or ceramic tile or porcelain tile would be exempt from VOC emissions testing because it is inherently non-emitting, but uh, tile setting materials are not. So um, you would have to go through third-party VOC emissions testing if you were a floor setting manufacturer. Um, it's required for almost all green building standards and certification programs, including LEED, Living Building Challenge, and WELL. And again, they have to get tested to show compliance with CDPH. 
Uh, there are a wide range of VOC emission certifications that are available. Um, these third-party programs include FloorScore, SCS Indoor Advantage Gold, CRI Green Label Plus, Declare Labels, uh, UL Green Guard Gold, and there's many more. Um, manufacturers have the option of which certification program that they choose to go with, and then they would have to meet um, not only the CDPH requirements, but also the requirements of the uh, testing bodies and the, uh, the third-party testing body and the third-party certifier. But they're all um, testing to the same requirements of CDPH standard method version 1.2. This is an example of VOC emission certification. Uh, again, we set the show conformance with CDPH and um, TVOC ranges as highlighted here. The next section is material ingredient reporting. So material ingredient disclosures focus on the negative effects uh, that building materials have on human health and wellness. There's currently, um, there's no regulations currently that a manufacturer has to meet. Um, suppliers don't have to disclose product information beyond their, their SDSs and same thing for manufacturers. Um, but manufacturers may offer these disclosures uh, if they feel this is the right thing um, for their products to, to share. Um, there's several reports or declarations that provide chemical ingredient disclosure information, um, like the manufacturer inventory or an MI, uh, health product declarations or HPDs, there's also cradle to cradle certifications, declare labels, and uh, UL product lens, and, and many more. These that you see here are the most, uh, most popular. This is an example of a material ingredient report. Uh, chemical ingredients in the product are inventoried to at least uh, 1,000 ppms under a manufacturer inventory or an MI. And uh, manufacturers have to provide the uh, ingredient name, cast number, the role of that ingredient, and the amount of that ingredient in a product, as well as its hazard category. Again, some, some manufacturers who choose to do this um, can self-declare these claims, or they can go through a third party to verify claims. And we talked about it earlier, the red list. Um, Again, this is developed by the International Living Future Institute, or ILFI. And they developed a red list of chemicals that cannot be used or cannot be included in materials that are used in construction uh, for projects that are pursuing living building challenge. Uh, according to ILFI, the list is composed of materials that should be phased out of production due to health concerns. So it's a pretty large list and it gets updated um, as new sciences emerge. Uh, so I, I think at least once a year, the red list is updated uh, to and sent to manufacturers to make sure or encourage manufacturers to avoid using um, products on the or materials on this red list. There are also a certification called Green Squared. It's a multi-sustainable attribute standard. It's a certification that looks at um, everything that we just talked about. So it looks at uh, environmental impacts, health impacts, but also social impacts. It was created by TCNA or Tile Council of North America. They have a green initiative committee. Uh, it's submitted to ANSI and it's uh, accredited through the A. 108, um, and sorry, and the ANSI A138.1 uh, green squared, which is the uh, standard for sustainable ceramic tiles, glass tiles, and tile installation materials. Uh, there is a, a marketplace recognition uh, for sustainable tiles or tile installation materials in using green squared certification or claiming green squared certification. It sets the bar for um, technical specification of, of sustainability within tile and tile installation materials. And this is an example of green squared certification. 
So in summary, I know that was a lot, um, each product should have one or more of the attributes that we discussed to be considered sustainable. Simple, right? Uh, the complexity comes into play when there are various options for achieving each of these and various third-party testing bodies and uh, third-party certifiers. So EPDs, there are, uh, we mentioned three different formats and there are at least uh, three different uh, certifying bodies that um, will review your life cycle assessments and produce uh, environmental product declarations or certify your product declarations. Um, material ingredients, there's at least five different types, each with varying transparency disclosure requirements. Um, they, they also require third-party certification. Um, so you have to research uh, the different transparency documents to find out which one works best for your project um, and which works best for the green building certification program that you're pursuing. Uh, low emitting materials, there are four different types of certifying bodies and there's also uh, you know, different third party certification. So again, it's overwhelming in the amount of um, green product certifications that are out there. But um, just to summarize, if you can find at least a product that has an environmental product declaration or has recycled content or has a material ingredient report and, and VOC emissions and, and low VOC content. Um, if you can find a product that has all of those, great. They, they do exist where you can have up to seven different uh, sustainable attributes or certifications, uh, but even having one um, helps project teams qualify to contribute to, to green building programs. Is it possible to find products that have all of these attributes? Yes. Will every product have them? No, and they're not required to. Uh, but again, the more certifications or attributes, the merrier the project team. And then depending on, on what green building standard or certification system that the project is pursuing, some of these attributes may be more important than others. Uh, so for example, a project team pursuing LEED certification may want to find a product that has all or, or most of these, uh, while a project pursuing well building standard may want to find a product that has uh, VOC emissions certification or, or material ingredients reports. Manufacturers summarize green product certifications and attributes either on a, a document or their website or third party databases such as Mindful Materials. This is an example of MAPE's sustainability product report. Uh, each applicable product would have a report. Uh, it summarizes all of the uh, sustainable attributes or certifications uh, a single product can have. So I encourage you to, to reach out to manufacturers and, and, and having seen this presentation now, um, knowing that there's, there is more than one attribute or there is more than one certification that you could ask for. And that brings us to the end. All right. Thank you, Brittany. No um, problem. Let's, let's see. We do have some questions here. The first one, how do they request sustainability information? Kind of like what we just talked about. So I, <laughs> with with going to uh, the manufacturer's website, or if if you have a sales rep, start with your sales rep. Um, ask them about uh, the sustainable certifications that are available. So they should be able to walk you through uh, what product or what products make sense from a technical perspective, and then they can reach out to their sustainability department um, to to get more information. Um, also checking manufacturer websites or if you're a seasoned sustainability pro um, and you know where to dig for certifications, check out uh, third-party databases like Mindful Materials or Ecomedes or uh, better, ma better Materials, I believe is what USGBCs is called. Um, yeah, and a lot of our uh, product pages have all that information where they have all of our product information right there, don't we? I mean, you've you've really made it uh, very user friendly. I have to say. 
Correct. Yeah, each each product page, um, or there is a sustainability uh, section within um, the pay site called the product information library. I believe it's called. Correct me if I'm wrong. And um, you can filter by what which sustainable attribute you're looking for, or uh, the the summary of all of them, which is a sustainability product report. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're looking for an easy way to uh, find that, just go. Um, go to the environmental page and you can click through that way or you can go and access that through our tools for architects page is another easy way to uh, get to those uh, those tools um, another question oh this is a good one what is my pay's greenest product but you get asked that a lot yeah that's a it's a <laughs> tough question but we do get that one a lot uh, the cliche answer would be all of them um, you know, we, we try to make all of our products green or as sustainable as we can um, because sustainability is a big part of, of what we do at Mapay. Um, I know it's that's not really an answer, um, but it, it's hard to answer that question. Um, what's considered green to one person may not be the same or it may be completely different to another person. Um, truthfully, it's not possible to make every single product green, but we do make an effort to get uh, as many green certifications or that make the most sense for our, our customers. Um, you know, the green, we, we understand what, what green building certification programs are asking of our customers and we understand what's expected of us as a manufacturer. And as a result, we have we have hundreds of green products. Um, I would say some some products have one certification or one attribute, while others have all seven that we talked about. Um, and, and everything in between. So the green, the greenest product depends on what green building standard you're pursuing, uh, what version you're pursuing, and what product type you're looking for before you can call it a specific. So I, I can't say like a wood flooring adhesive is better than a cement grout um, because at Mape we're we're truly looking at each product individually to determine what certifications make the most sense for that particular product. Um, I, I could call out the greenest product uh, for each product type, but we, we would be here all day. <laughs> I don't think we want to take up more of their time than we, <laughs> we <Probably need>. not. <laughs> It'd be best if they contact you on an individual basis. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, here's one that's kind of playing off of that, um, sort of, of all the certifications you've shared, which one? do you feel is the most important? VOC emission certification, specifically for, for flooring or floor setting products. Um, one, because this certification is asked for on every single green building certification. Again, even do-it-yourselfers are asking for this. Um, but also, any material or product on a building project can tr contribute to uh, sustainable projects like having an EPD or an HPD or recycled content. Uh, however, if you have an adhesive or a sealant or a coating uh, that doesn't have a VOC emission certification, there's more room for error. Um, like under LEED version 4, 90% of projects adhesive sealants coatings have to comply with VOC emissions requirements. It's a little less stringent under version 4.1. There's a, there's a little bit more wiggle room in that it's 75% have to comply, but oh, let's wow. just say nine out of 10 products have to have a VOC emissions certification. So you, you don't want to be that one person or that one company with the non-compliant product and risk the the, the entire project um, missing points to, to earn certification for whatever level you're achieving. Yeah. <laughs> That uh, would not be good. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I, that's that's interesting that they lowered the requirement for the newer, the newer version. I th I think they're starting to see uh, manufacturers are on board with with making this happen, and and they know what's being asked of them. Um, it's just, and I've been on this the sustainability consulting side where I, I, I've what takes a manufacturer so long to go through testing and. But now being on the, on the manufacturing side and seeing like the the requirements for each project having product having to go through uh, testing sort of there's there's chamber testing where they have to be in in, in chambers for two weeks there's 
I, you know, you're dealing with a third party tester, then you have to deal with a third party certifier and it's, it, it takes a long time and then multiply that times how many projects you have. It, 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 it's very time consuming. I understand why it takes so long. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, uh, it's not a simple, a simple proposition by any means, is it? No. Um, all right. Well, uh, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, type now, or if you think of uh, any questions in the interim, you can always send them to us here at uh, Mape Digital at mape.com, and we'll be sure to get them over to uh, Brittany. And uh, again, thank you, Brittany, for a great presentation. And thank you, everybody, for spending uh, some time with us this afternoon. We know that uh, you have very busy lives, and we do appreciate you taking uh, your time to spend with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Brittany. Have a good one. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye, everybody.